welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and it's great to be back in the Sunflower House. This is the summer of 2023, and summer can be really hard on hair and skin. And I just got back from having a hydrofacial done. And I thought, oh, this would be a good time to talk about um, skin care for women and skin problems that are more common in menopause, as well as rosacea, which is a common problem. Uh, It can happen to to not just women, but also men. But we're going to talk about some of the issues in women. So even though it's so uplifting to be in the sunflower house, we know that sun can be very damaging to skin and hair. So today's podcast is going to contain material from um, a number of columns on Speaking of Women's Health. And if you don't already get our free monthly newsletter and health tip, please go to speakingofwomenshealth.com and subscribe. Very easy, takes a minute or two, and it's completely free. Now we have done other podcasts And you can subscribe to our podcast for free anywhere you listen to podcasts. And please give us a five-star rating if you would. Um, And some of the podcasts we've already done have been on hair thinning and how glowing skin is always in. In fact, that's what stimulated me to go get a hydrofacial today was that interview with skincare esthetician Lori Skarsko. So... Um, the skincare tips for midlife and beyond, tips and advice to keep your skin looking healthy. This was written over a decade ago by plastic surgeon Sylvia Rottenberg. And she was a plastic surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic and then transferred her practice to South Miami, Florida, where there's lots of sun. And she specializes in reconstruction of the breast using various surgical techniques, including fat grafting, implants, and of course she has uh, quite a bit of expertise in cosmetic procedures of the face. So women do tend to experience changes in skin at the time of menopause. Um, Many women, not all, but many women notice that the skin is thinner, more delicate, more sensitive. There can be age spots or brown spots or so-called liver spots, which aren't from liver, they're from aging. And loss of collagen, uh, which comes with aging, with sun exposure, and with loss of estrogen, which can be very rapid in those five to seven years after menopause. (laughs) Many women start to notice um, changes, including wrinkles. And the kind of skincare regimen that you had in your 20s or 30s is probably not best for once you hit your 40s, 50s, and beyond. So Dr. Rottenberg recommends a four-step menopausal skin regimen starting with um, being aware that the skin is more sensitive and you want to stimulate and also protect the skin. In fact, that was the first thing I asked when I um, left my skincare esthetician, Cynthia Priola, which hopefully we'll have her on a podcast interview. I said, did you put sunscreen on? Because it was a bright, bright, sunny day. She said, oh, of course. I do that always with all of my, all of my patients and clients. So... Um, the first thing of course is cleansing the skin twice a day with a facial cleanser, but a lot of cleansers can be really harsh on sensitive skin. And so if you notice that your skin starts to get tight within like 15 to 20 to 30 minutes after you've cleansed your face, you need to switch to a moisturizing cleanser. The second thing after cleansing is correcting and preventing problems. So some women can get acne breakouts after menopause. And spot treatment with over-the-counter therapies, including salicylic acid, uh, can be used. A lot of times during this time, or even earlier in life, I certainly got hyperpigmentation melasma with my first pregnancy. Uh, And a lot of times that becomes more prominent with sun exposure. So whether it's melasma from hormonal stimulation or brown spots or aging spots, There's certainly a lot of different treatments, um, including bleaching creams that have to be prescribed, retinoic acid, and vitamin C. And every single day, 
you need to apply full spectrum UVA and B sunscreen. And we did a great uh, podcast earlier on everything you wanted to know about sunscreens and were afraid to ask. The third phase is to stimulate, and a collagen builder like uh, retinol, Retin-A, can help your skin renew itself more quickly than it might naturally. And an exfoliant can improve your skin's appearance and reduce pimples and blackheads and then allow your moisturizer to penetrate the skin. And retinol is available over the counter and there are higher prescription doses. But certainly it's really get best to get your physician, dermatologist, skincare estheticians advice. To get the most out of retinol treatments, it's recommended that you apply it in the evening when the sun is sh- when the skin is sheltered from the sun, wind and other uh, damaging environmental factors. And it appears the skin might absorb things a little bit better at night. And then the fourth step to do after cleansing and correcting and stimulating is protecting. So in addition to your menopausal skin regimen, protecting your skin from the sun is an absolute must because even the smallest amount of sun damage and exposure is going to accelerate aging and kind of undo what you've done. So you should regularly apply full spectrum sunscreen every morning and then reapply if you're outside. And many sunscreen products do not uh, require UVA to be included, uh, but many do have it. And you really want a broad spectrum UVA and B SPF 30 or more. There's not too much difference between 30 and anything higher. Now, if you use an SPF 15 moisturizer on top of an SPF 15 foundation, that does not equal 30, even though 15 plus 15 equals 30. It may seem logical, but it doesn't offer the same protection as going up to an SPF of 30. So I never buy anything below 30 myself. So when you start to see changes in your skin, the earlier you start a good skincare regimen, the better. The good news is that you can reverse some types of skin sun damage. uh, And skin cancer, for the most part, is very, very treatable. In fact, I just got my husband a same day dermatology appointment because he noticed an area on his skin and I thought it looked like it might be a precancer and he got right in and they did a biopsy so don't ignore things that don't get better within a week or so always remember that a healthy diet adequate sleep you know sleeping sleeping beauty you need your beauty sleep and of course do not smoke and if you do We have a lot of resources on our website to help you stop smoking or using nicotine and stay hydrated because hydration helps you uh, maintain moisture and kind of that glowing appearance. So in terms of some of the common unwanted skin changes during menopause, this next section is coming from a column from one of our Cleveland Clinic dermatologists who is still practicing at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Dr. Rashmi Anwala, and she's a board-certified dermatologist, and she sees patients at main campus, and she got her medical degree from the University of Miami School of Medicine, and then did a residency at Jackson uh, Hospital in Miami, and then has been at the Cleveland Clinic since 2019. And anyone who might want an appointment with a a skincare dermatologist that specializes in skincare problems in menopause, you can call 216-444-5729 to make an appointment with Dr. Anwala. So unwanted skin changes uh, can occur pretty quickly or they may be very slow and it depends on the hormonal balance. It also depends on one's genetics one's skin care regimen, underlying medical conditions. So some of the most common concerns are hair thinning and dry skin. Now, at any age, you can have dry skin. In fact, my oldest son, Stetson, is always after me to not bathe his daughter, Artemis, too much because he had very dry skin as a child and still does. And, of course, she is a child with sensitive skin. And I tell women that as you get older, it's like, going back to a baby stage where you have to be so much more 
um, careful with what you apply on the skin. And the skin around the nipples and the genitals become very, very uh, sensitive with aging, just like they are in children. So in terms of hair thinning, we have a free treatment guidebook on hair thinning, and we've already done an entire podcast on how hair thinning is not for dear old dad. We did that around the time of Father's Day in June of 2023, if you want to go back and listen to that. Um, it's normal to have some hair thinning with age, just like it's normal to have changes in our skin and our whole entire body with aging. But there are things that happen at midlife that can um, exacerbate it, particularly uh, loss of hormones, nutritional deficiencies, extra stress. So certainly a healthy diet is very, very important. Many women um, generally with aging get a slow increase in weight despite regular exercise and a healthy diet. And um, my mantra is you have to eat less and exercise more just to stay the same. So it's not good to go on crash diets or eliminate entire categories of food, which a lot of times people do, because that doesn't usually lead to sustainable weight loss, and that can actually trigger hair shedding called telogen effluvium, T-E, telogen effluvium. And this is when up to a third of your hair enters the shedding phase all at one time, and you can lose three to 400 hairs a day instead of the typical 100 to 150 hairs a day. Women can experience a dramatic loss of volume in their hair that can take a long time to recover. And your hair fall... We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG. And we're the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. need protein and iron to produce strong, healthy hair. And my first podcast at the very beginning when we started this at the beginning of 2023 is on iron. So if you don't have enough of these important nutrients, it can result in poor hair growth. And recently there's been some articles in the news about using rosemary oil on the scalp to stimulate hair growth. And um, my nurse, Alexandria, who hopefully will be on this podcast to talk about uh, her role in being our lead nurse in the Center for Specialized Women's Health, was telling me that um, you can distill or make red onion juice, which is very rich in flavonoids, and put that on the scalp. Um, So I was thinking about doing that the other day, and my husband's like, no, no, you already smell like onions and garlic all the time so um but i think that just builds upon the fact that um just like when you put vitamin c on your skin to help improve collagen you obviously need to be ingesting enough vitamin c to help from the inside out so applying things topically can certainly affect the hair follicles but you really need to also do it from the inside out So aiming slow and steady weight loss through healthy changes in your diet is important. And we have a number of podcasts already that focus on weight loss. You do need adequate protein uh, and should have at least one protein-rich meal per day. And iron-rich foods such as beans and lentils, iron-fortified cereals, lean meat, some green leafy vegetables, very, very important. Now, sometimes it's overlooked, but very important that just healthy hairstyling tips can make a big difference. Um, Just like we might adjust the styles, um, the type of clothing we wear, even the type of jewelry we wear, sometimes you do need to alter your hairstyling tips. And if you've gone most of your adult life using heat and chemicals on your hair, um, some women find that their hair has kind of lost some of its shine and fullness. 
and that can lead to more breakage, which can lead to um, having hair that just doesn't grow quite as well. So if you color your hair, you might want to extend the time and the interval between those treatments. Try to reduce heat styling with flat irons or blow dryers and use lower temperatures. Certainly, I um, just stopped washing my hair as frequently um, because in one, I'm, you just make less oil production with age and um, I found that that reduced the stress on my hair. And try to avoid the harsh treatments to change the texture of your hair, such as permanents. Now, women of color are particularly at risk for damage and breakage to their delicate hair. So gentle hair care practices are really important for everyone to maintain strong and beautiful hair. Now, there are some over-the-counter hair loss treatments. Minoxidil or topical Rogaine is one of the best initial options to consider. Um, sometimes it's prescribed in low dose orally by some physicians. If you've got that family history of androgen pattern hair thinning, the temporal area, the top of the scalp, using the 5% high potency foam can definitely help your hair grow. Um, you need to do it consistently and you need to be patient. It can take up to six months, but it will regrow your hair. There are many supplements that advertise that they help hair regrow, but um, biotin, which is a B vitamin, um, in very high doses, it seems to help the nails more than the hair follicles, and it interferes with all sorts of lab assays, and the FDA has come out with a warning, and really, if you're on anything that has biotin in it, you've got to wait at least three days before getting your blood work, and if you're going in because of an acute cardiac event where you have to have the blood work done, the blood can be falsely uh, normal. And there was a death of a woman from cardiac problems that prompted the FDA to give this warning. I think that protein and iron and zinc and um, vitamin E and reducing stress and getting the hormones in balance, using the right hair care products, I think that all of that takes so much more priority over expensive hair vitamins. So dry skin, especially during menopause, well, the skin can lose some of its elasticity and thickness with menopause, which can result in dry, dull skin that can itch or flake. Fortunately, there's a lot of different steps that you can take to prepare your skin for these changes and allow your skin to glow at any age. Number one, avoid cigarette smoking. Any smoke prematurely ages the skin and leads to wrinkles and enlarged pores. And you can often spot a woman who smokes because she frequently has lots of um, wrinkles uh, in the upper lip from constantly sucking on the cancer stick. Protect your skin from the sun. Regular use of high SPF broad spectrum sunscreen along with hat, and glasses, and sun protective clothing can help your skin from losing its resilience. Can't, don't forget the decolle area, the neck, the upper chest, the hands, the arms, not just your face. Be gentle to your skin. Many products like toners and especially exfoliating treatments can be much too harsh for daily use. So use a moisturizer with hyaluronic acids, glycerin, or ceramides to help combat dry skin. And you might want to consider seeing a board certified dermatologist if these are not enough to keep your skin and hair healthy. And there are uh, procedures that can be done for skin rejuvenation, but I would caution you to just go to someone who's not trained in this, who's just added it to their practice for cash-based business. Now on our website, we have information about skin care for all ages, beauty tips, skin care information related to aging, free treatment guidebook for hair thinning, and also a menopausal free treatment guidebook. And if you haven't uh, listened or read my uh, book, The Cleveland Clinic Guide to Menopause, I just updated that, um, all the chapters on podcast. So lastly, I want to talk about rosacea. 
What is rosacea? Well, it's a chronic, kind of irritating, inflammatory skin condition that can affect the face, mainly the forehead, nose, and cheeks, and it can cause redness with visible blood vessels called telangiectasias. Some may even see tiny red pus-filled bumps, pustules, and papules, and you can have a flare-up weeks to months followed by no symptoms at all. And rosacea can be uh, confused with facial acne, so a lot of people don't seek treatment. So it does most commonly affect midlife women, ages 30 to 60. Also, fair-skinned people seem to be affected a little more. It can affect at younger ages and men, uh, and men may actually develop a more severe form of this condition, which can involve the nose, rhinophyma, the eyes, the eyelashes. And certainly people with darker skin tones can be affected, um, but unfortunately they can be underdiagnosed and underestimated uh, just because of the darker skin tone makes it a little bit more difficult to uh, identify that red rosacea hallmarks, including the prolonged flushing of the face. And of course, um, midlife women who have untreated hot flashes and vasomotor symptoms can just think that the redness is from that. And even though a little bit of rosy red cheeks kind of looks um, healthy, if it's something that's new, um, it could be early rosacea. So I think it is good to talk to your physician about it because increasing evidence suggests that the demodex mites may play a role in the pathogenesis of rosacea. Several factors suggested to play a role are genetics, changes to the immune system, a defective skin barrier, and increased bacteria on the face's surface. And then of course, environmental factors like ultraviolet light, wind exposure, alcohol, uh, fluctuating or low hormone levels, all can make this worse. Usually it's recommended to avoid the oil-based cleansers and to also exfoliate once or twice a week to help remove the dead skin cells. Some of the common triggers are extreme temperature fluctuations and hot flashes. And luckily, we have hormones and non-hormonal options to treat hot flashes. So really, no woman should have to suffer with these symptoms. Now, spicy foods can make it worse. Alcohol, stress, either emotional or physical, intense exercise, sunlight, ultraviolet light, strong winds, and also caffeine, you know, a little bit of java, may be good to get you going in the morning, reduce pain, reduce fatty liver, may have some brain benefits, but some people really do overdo it with the caffeine. Now, certain medicines can cause dilation of the blood vessels, such as topical corticosteroids, B3 niacin, which sometimes is used in high doses to treat cholesterol problems, can definitely make facial flushing and rosacea worse. So, if you're on these medicines and having flushing, you might want to discuss this with your physician. And remember, this podcast is not medical advice. It's just to empower you to be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. Now, lupus erythematosus, which is more common in women, it's an autoimmune condition, can prevent, present with a butterfly facial rash, although rarely has pimples and bumps like with rosacea. So what are the symptoms of rosacea? Well, the National Rosacea Society Expert Committee put together a system to help standardize the diagnosis of rosacea. And back in 2004, they established a classification system based on primary and secondary features of rosacea. So a person having more than one primary symptom could still be diagnosed with rosacea. And primary features include flushing of the face, redness of the face, visible dilated blood vessels called telangiectasias, papules, which are small bumps, and pustules when the red bump fills with pus. Now, secondary features of rosacea are symptoms outside the face, like dry, red, gritty eyes, blepharitis. And we did talk about dry eyes and treatment of dry eyes in the Dry Eye podcast. A dry appearance to the skin. And any phimetous skin changes, which is skin thickening or irregular skin surfaces and nodularities on the face. And you can see this many times in the nose. Skin plaques, which are elevated lesions greater than a centimeter. Swelling of the face or other affected skin. 
and burning or stinging of the face can also be described. Rhinophyma is an enlarged nose, and this can happen when the skin gets thick on the nose, appearing very bulbous or bumpy. And it can be not always a complication of rosacea. Sometimes we see it in heavy alcohol drinkers. It does appear that rhinophyma occurs more commonly in men compared to women. So what are the different subtypes of rosacea? Well, there's four of them. The first one is erythematotelangiectatic, which is permanent facial redness, visible telangiectasias, increased skin sensitivity with burning and stinging sensation, and more often than not, there's flushing of the face. The second type is the papulopustule, which is like acne with papules and pustules and a scaly rough feel to the skin. A little bit less often to have that facial flushing. Uh, the phimatus is where the skin's thickened with enlarged sebaceous oil glands, and it can affect the nose, causing rhinophyma, again, a little more common in men. The fourth kind is ocular, and 50% of people with rosacea get ocular. It can give a dry, gritty sensation, swelling of the eyelids, recurrent styes, and sometimes you can see visible red blood vessels actually in the conjunctiva, which cover the white scleral part of the eye. So how does a physician diagnose rosacea? Well, it can be um, done basically on the basis of history and physical exam. You don't need any special blood test, uh, but there might be blood tests done to exclude other conditions like uh, lupus, psoriasis, or eczema. How do we treat rosacea? Well, you wanna use a gentle face cleanser twice a day. You wanna maintain healthy, healthy and clean skin uh, with a normal pH. You want a facial moisturizer that has a mixture of occlusive oily substances which help hold in the water and humectant substances that attract water to the skin. Sunscreen, 30 plus SPF to protect against ultraviolet radiation. Also an inorganic sunscreen with zinc oxide and titanium oxide is generally preferred because it's less sticky and it doesn't increase skin warmth which tends to worsen symptoms and avoiding all those rosacea triggers are important. Now, what about moving on to medical pharmacologic treatments? There are several FDA approved treatments, azelaic acid, metronidazole, sodium sulfacetamide, and brimonidine, which is an alpha adrenergic agonist. There's off-label options like benzoyl peroxide you can get over the counter, a prescription clindamycin, topical, ivermectin, topical tretoin, which is a vitamin A derivative, and also tacrolimus. There's also systemic treatment, not just topical. Oral tetracyclines, assuming you're not pregnant, breastfeeding, or a child. Off-label, sometimes um, systemic metronidazole is used, amoxicillin. Propranolol, which is a beta blocker, sometimes used to treat migraines or high blood pressure, or cardiac problems, carvedilil, which is another beta blocker, oral accutane, isotretinoid in significant cases, and oral ivermectin. There's other treatment options. Light-based treatments like laser or pulsed light rays can be very effective. Usually it's considered cosmetic, so a lot of times insurance won't cover it, but uh, one of our nurses had it done and she's so glad because she's not had any other flares of rosacea since she had it done. Surgical treatment, excision, dermabrasion, removal of the superficial skin layer, and electrosurgery, high frequency electric current used to heat and um, affect the targeted skin. So rosacea is very, very common. It can wax and wane. And if you're experiencing any symptoms, it's really good to talk to your uh, physician or your advanced practice provider or your primary care doctor or a pot potentially a referral to a dermatologist because it's generally better to start treatment sooner rather than later and also figure out what your triggers are to help you be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. And all this information 
on rosacea is available on our Speaking of Women's Health website and was uh, authored by Dr. Tiffany Cochran, who also authored the wonderful column and information on dry eyes. So thank you so much for joining me in our sunflower house. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and I hope you'll subscribe to our podcast. You'll go on our website. If you're happy and this information has been helpful for you, you might want to make a donation to our nonprofit, speakingofwomenshealth.com. <laughs>